King Gonzalez, Joaquin, uh, he is, he's part of the Planck and he's involved in the, the part of Planck that is basically to, to model the point sources for the ground to remove it. So lots of the stuff that you're going to see me present is basically an extension of what we do in, on CMB for point sources. Uh, so the question that I always ask, and sometimes some people could ask is, why, why you're so interested to study foreground? grounds? Why it's so interesting to do foreground ground simulation? And probably for most part of people in this room, the answer to that question is number one, because you want to model and subtract the, the foreground grounds, because what you want to do is detect the cosmological signal. And then also, if you, if you are making a data analysis pipeline, or if you are projecting your experiment, it's nice if you have simulation so that you can basically play with a bunch of different things like scan strategy or in things like that, right? Sensitivity, how much time you have to spend in a point, and all, the, all kinds of stuff. I am interested in one too, but probably some of us feel, like me, it also interests in number two, because I also think that's a wonderful tool for us to learn about uh, non-cosmological stuff, basically to learn about our own galaxy. There is lots of nice and beautiful physics on that. Uh, so what is it all about? The idea is to, is to make what we call the GSM model. So we had done before something that was, we tried to model the diffuse emission. Because basically what happens is, at 21 centimeters in CMB frequencies, you have a bunch of components of emission of the, our galaxy. So you have synchrotron, you have free free. As you go up in the frequencies, you have dust emission, rotational dust. Maybe you have what they call spinning dust. And you could also add uh, point sources. So, but for 21 centimeters, what is really relevant is basically synchrotron and maybe some free free. Okay? So the whole idea is to do then a global sky model of what, what our galaxy is doing so that the people in 21 centimeters, they can, as they do in their own pipelines to, to analyze or they are projecting their experiments, they have some stuff, something to start to work on. So the first thing we did was model the diffuse emission. Why? Because it's the simplest. So we basically took a bunch of different surveys, total area, total power uh, sky surveys from 10 megahertz to 100. So we were a little bit ambitious. So not only 21 centimeters, let's go up to CMB2. Once you have, I'll consider that the best galactic surveys we have today, they are in the CMB frequency, right? Once you remove CMB, you have those beautiful maps. You probably saw W map and Planck maps. So we took those surveys. Sometimes you have to OCR because some things are old. You put everybody in a common format, same angular resolution. Sometimes surveys, they don't observe the same space. Lots of surveys have empty space. We tried many different things. And then in the end, the only thing that worked was something that calls a TCA. So, uh, so the whole idea is, in the end of the day, what you have is, let's see if I can, this screen doesn't quite work. So in the end of the day, what you have is you, you can download the software, and you, you say, I want a map of our galaxy at 150 gigahertz. Press the button. He gives you a Helpix image, already everything done. And then he also gives you a map, not only the temperature in the top, but also gives you a map of the spectral index, how the spectral index change in frequency. For, in this case, it's just plotting for what is relevant for MWA. And then you can also have the running of the spectral index, because it's a spline, the first and the second derivative of the spline. So that's the diffuse. But there is other foreign grounds that are important to 21 centimeters, for some point sources. So then we enter the second step. How can you simulate point sources? And later on, add to this GSM model. And then later on, we are going to add also polarization, make like rotation measurement maps and things, and add all to, the, to this data. OK, so our idea now is to also add point sources to, to the GSM, OK? Uh, what, what usually happens is we have almost no information at very, very low frequencies, like 100, 200 megahertz and things like that. We don't have deep surveys. And the basically, all the, the bulk of the information that we have, they are in the microwave regime. So, as a first approximation, people have been doing this for a long time, is, OK, 
I don't know what is happening the frequency that I need, so I'm going to extrapolate from microwaves all the way to the frequency that I need. So all the, all the way to, let's say, 30 gigahertz that I know well to 100 megahertz. And, uh, and, uh, and because of this thing, so one of the results that come from the CMB is for long and many years of study, today we know that around the CMB frequencies, clustering, for example, is not an important thing. But for example, if you go to far infrared point sources, this become a really, really big problem. And you can, if anybody's curious, I have zillion references from Tofolati, Desotti, all kinds of studies about this with the scuba data and things like that. So, but recently we start to get interest in 21 centimeters. And then you can find, for example, some old papers like from Tiziana in which it says, well, you know, we don't have a deep survey, but maybe this is a problem you should at least think about because you don't know exactly, can be a, a jack in the box. You don't know what is, is coming to that. So the whole idea is that, uh, so usually what people do is, so then they basically, uh, in practice they say, I don't care about the point sources, I'm going to remove that easily, so let's forget because an extension CMB. So our question is the following, we don't know what is happening in those frequencies, so let's try to do some kind of study to see if our conclusions are correct. I hope they are. So what basically we did is, so then we tried to do, for example, a distribution of point sources. So there will be uh, the very bright stuff you are going to remove, but then it's going to be those that are below the limit, and there will be those that are very close to the limit of detection. So are we taking account, account of them correctly? So that's the whole idea why you do the simulation, okay? Uh, and in order to do a realistic simulation, you need to do two things about point sources. You need to know about their clustering, because we know point sources has a Poisson distribution, they are clustered. You, you observe this in any frequency, you, you look at them. And you also you need to know what they call the source counts, the, what some types you see that cause, cause the DNDS distribution. Okay? Once you have those two things, you can start then to try to simulate point sources. So we didn't have much about point sources, that the frequency that they are important for 21 centimeters. So basically, we decided to, okay, the first step, let's look at the clustering of point sources. So we went in the literature and got a bunch of different surveys, and then we, we want to measure what we call this W function, or what it is. Okay, so because you know that the clustering is usually quantified by what we call the two-point correlation function. So the whole idea is to get your catalog and measure this, um, this quantity. This quantity is going to tell you how much clustering you have. And in order to do that, you need to have a catalog. You need to make a make, uh, fake catalog. For this case in particular, we did what everybody else in the literature did because we didn't have a proper uh, simulation. So we basically just make a Poisson distribution of the sources. And then what you are measuring is the clustering against a Poisson distribution of, of uh, that's what it basically you are measuring on this W. So you went around, but you cannot just go around with all those catalogs. Some of those catalogs, they are very problematic. For example, sounds like an uneasy thing to construct a catalog, but it's actually not. Sometimes you can have uh, many of those catalogs, they can have like sensitivity change with, with declination. They are not very complete. They, they have a, what they call the flux, li the flux limit of the catalog is, is is very high, doesn't, you don't care, you're looking for things in milli and you have to get high up in the junk. So you have to, to play with those things. So in the, the end of the day, you don't have many options. You have things around 74 megahertz, very into 21 centimeters, and uh, going a little up. So I'm going to show one example of this. Oh, thank you, Danny. <laughs> one example, for example, that we did, for example, a catalog that we call at 74 megahertz, the v v VLSS, so this is basically the, the catalog. It's like a, a 68,000 sources. So we basically calculate the correlation function. We, ma we made a make catalog, just a Poisson distribution, taking care of, for example, the, always you have, remember, always your, you have to mask in the correct way, okay? Otherwise you're comparing apples with oranges. And then we, in the end of the day, what you find that this basically with a single power law, you can explain clustering in this whole catalog. And basically this clustering happens between 0.2 to 0.6 degrees. 
So basic, that's the, that's the only thing I need to know to go to, to study my classroom. And uh, I would like to point out also there is another interesting thing about this function here is that besides giving you the clustering, for those of you that like to do point sort study catalogs, this is a quite powerful tool if you want to look at in anything strange. For example, if you have, if you, for example, some catalogs, sometimes they, they are like plates, you put them together, right? And if you don't put them together, if you have you in between the edges, it's going to appear spikes in your catalog. So if you don't, as you don't con make the, construct that correctly, anything wrong is going to pop out. So even if you are construct a catalog, it's nice to get this function. Even if you are not looking for clustering, it's a way to control quality. And this is known, and this is being done in all frequencies and everything. The second step is we look for stuff around, the, around 151 megahertz. And for this case, we basically get no, no correlation whatsoever. And there is many problems associated with those catalogs. For example, some of them, they have, they have er errors in the position, in the flux density. Some of them, a as you go down, in, as, you, as you go up in declination, they change the sensitivity. So all kinds of bad things that can happen. And we have to go and analyze one by one and check one by one how good they were. But in the end of the day, we didn't get basically anything. And then finally, the only other catalog that we, dis we detect something was the Mi, Mi Yun, I think you pronounce. That's Chinese. That's in China. But for this case, we get like a double power law. It means we think that this part probably describes us, the clustering. And that part probably describes something else in the catalog. That's the fact that sensitivity change with, with uh, with declination, yeah. So when you, when you, in the end of the day, we want you, we, we are, we're going to pretend that there is a clustering described by this. So when you put everybody together, this is a, like a, a table with all the measurements we have in radio, not count far infrared point sources. Okay, this is above 150 gigahertz. This is another game. And uh, and also the, it's not interesting to us. We want to. We are looking at radio. So basically, what you get, the main, the main thing that you can get from this, from this column, is that clustering looks the same wherever the frequency you are, all the way from 74 megahertz to 5 gigahertz. They apparently are, are the same. And then, so in other, in other words, uh, we make an approximate, we, we, this, we realize that would not be, uh, and, and also detections at very high, low, at very high frequencies, they are like 10 sigmas, 20 sigmas. The place where we, we're interested for us is like one sigma detection. So in first approximation, I'm going to say that uh, everything we need to know at 21 centimeters here, we are going to look at, for example, somewhere around 1.4 gigahertz. Why you do that? Because uh, those are very deep, for example, those are very deep catalogs. And also, you could imagine that in order to have something very strange here, you, you can make the calculation, say, you need to have an extra, for example, s population of sources that peaks around 50 millijanski or something like this in order to, to alter this result. So in first approximation, I'm going to say, everything I do, I do at 1.4 gigahertz as a first approximation. So if you do that, so I am going to say that clustering goes around minus 0.8 or minus 1. And then I also need to use, go back and look at, for example, the distribution of points, the, the, what they call the DNDS, distribution of sources as 1.4. <clears throat> and for that, we, we, we found this nice paper in which he or she, I don't know, he made a, a he based, based a compilation of all the sources at 1.4 gigahertz. And, uh, and then he, and then you can go in the paper, that it's very well written, and he explained all the passages and everything. And then by the end of the day, they said that you could approximate this, this distribution by something that goes a six order polynomial. So the only thing you have to remember is that I'm going to use a formula like that to tell me at that frequency how many sources I have. And then I know clustering. And try to remember this, this curve, strange curve here, because I have to reproduce that by the end of the day. So now comes. I'm going to do the following. I'm going to put all the, at once, so it's easy for me to explain. So we're going to do a simulation of point sources. The idea behind, it's very simple. Uh, 
there is some trick details, but the idea is simple. So what you do is the following. First, I'm going to do a toy model that's a box. Let's say six by six degrees, so 512. So it means that you have 0.7 Archimina pixels. So what you do is the following. I know that point sources, they have a Poisson distribution. So you just go there. For each pixel, you pick it up, up uh, from a Poisson distribution, and you put in there pixel by pixel. So then, but I don't do much with that. What I need, what is called the projected density contrast. So what I do is, for each pixel I have this number, I define what I call an average. An average is I have to come back to my source distribution and divide that total number by the total number of pixels I have in this image. Then you, they, you define an average. And then once you have an average, you can define a contrast. And why this is important? Because you can show that the covariance of the contrast is defined by the two-point correlation function. All those things, they are connected. So once you have that, the whole idea is done. I need to be is just to get the power spectrum. So what you do is, you have your distribution of sources. You fast Fourier. You go to Fourier space. Now you see point sources, they have a white, uh, white type of uh, power distribution. Here is also like the power spectrum of point sources is like a straight line. It's white noise. And what you do is, in Fourier space, you know, you know what the power spectrum is, and you, you know what is this, because you know this formula. You measure the two-point angular. The two-point is in real space. You transform it to power spectrum. You go to the Fourier space, and you add that. And then you have a map that has Poisson clustering, fast Fourier transform back, and you have your density field with clustering added. So the idea is very simple. And then, I don't do anything with density contrast, but I need to know in each pixel how many counts I have. So I just do the inverse of that, and I have a map in counts. Now comes the trick part. How I'm going to make counts become fluxes? Because some of those, you have 1.4, 3.7. How the heck you, you define this as a count, as a flux, and how you, are, you, you, you change from one thing to the other? So in order to do that, there is two things that you always need to have in mind for the simulation to, to, to be real. Uh, you need to know the differential counts. That is what we use in the, I told you that I showed. Remember this curve that we have? You need that in the beginning when you define the, the mean, your density contrast. And you're going to need this now, again, to de define the fluxes. Because from that, you are going to have the total number of fluxes and how much is going to be the flux in each one. And you also uh, need to always remember that you have to keep the power spectrum. So in other words, once you come back to, you, once you come back to whatever it is and you, you give them flux numbers, always you get again that map and calculate the DNDS of that map and then and check it out. If it, what you get in the next exit is what you put in. That's a way to control. And another thing is, the power spectrum, for example, this is the power spectrum of Poisson, for those of you that never saw that before. And this is what looks like the power spectrum of, uh, of clustering. This is, my out, this is the power spectrum that comes out when you have clustering plus, plus Poisson. And you see that looks like, so whatever I put in, I get it out. That's the way that you keep your simulation realistic. So then you have always to have those two things. So now what I do, I have then counts how I'm going to give numbers to those counts. So basically, in, in this case, we decide to do this in a random way. You could do this in a different way. You could, for example, do like people do far infrared point sources. You go and say, the highest flux goes to the higher fluctuations. In that way, you, you deal with bias. But somehow, for the case of radio, it doesn't quite work like that. So what, you, what we basically did, then you have a map. You floor that map, it means you, if you have 1.4 here, in that pixel, I have floor. So now I say I have one count. The difference between these two is I lose a 0.4 information. Okay? How am I going to do that? I play probability. So I, I, run, I make a random number. That random number, I decide it's going to be, for example, bigger than 0.4. I say you have only one pixel. If it happens that I pull the number from my head and say it's 0.2, I have two, two counts in that source. And then once you have that, you just go with your list of sources and put them in a random way. And I have two counts. I put two fluxes. 
and that's the way you fill it up your map. That's the way, in the end of the day, we have what we call the realistic point sources. That is what I showed before. Then you have this. And then we, if you do the power spectrum of this map, you are going to get something that looks like the power spectrum if you get a point source catalog and you, you make the power spectrum of that. And the distribution is going to look at the distribution of the sources you have in your map. Uh, so this was for a patch. But I want to add this to my GSM, right? So the main idea is, and also later on, I want to come back to those papers I wrote. And, uh, and it's something a little more, more neat, more beautiful, is that forget about this Poisson simple thing. And let's do some kind of likelihood in which you change your map, you change the, the you make it more sensitive to go to all back to all those surveys and see you look for clustering. Let's change the clustering and see how is the best detection. So one way to do this, to deliver the software, we are going to deliver all this thing in HeoPix. How you do that? It's very simple. You just have to make a map. You just have to generate the ALMs. Remember, from the average square of ALMs is what we call the power spectrum, the Cisabel. So I know what's supposed to be the power spectrum of the cluster resource. So I just enter here. And then if I would use something like some subroutines of HeoPix, I can basically have those things. So the whole thing is, is easy. So in the end of the day, when we, we tell you guys you can have a map that you can, for example, download, not a map, but you have a software that you can download, what you have is a, is a program that is going to call a bunch of HeoPix subroutines, a, a Fortran program that sometimes calls HeoPix. So you need to have HeoPix in your computer. And then also this program is going to be very open in the sense that you can, you can tell, I want to make a, a simulation in a certain limits of my distribution. And I want to change resolution. And uh, all, those, all those things, and also, for example, you can also, we are going to give not only a distribution for radio, but you can also give, for example, Tofolat's distribution of uh, infrared point sources. So you can basically also press the bot at any frequency, and, and you get a full simulation. So basically, it's just that. OK. I, I was super fast, I told you. OK, so the whole idea, yes, we want to, ex we, we want to extend our model. And uh, so we, we're now finishing to do, we basically have, if anybody needs, we have the, the, the square, the flat sky simulations. They are done. But we now finish to implement the, the heel picks. So yeah, I think just that. That was the fastest talk that I ever gave in my whole life. OK. OK. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Yeah. Can you also generate a catalog? Yes, in principle, you can generate a catalog. Because what matters, what happens in, you cannot see very much in those because I didn't finish the normalization of that. But for example, if you look at here, there will be many points that they are, they are empty. Because when you go to that procedure of making real into integers to have counts in pixels, there will be people that's going to be 0 0.3, 0 0.4, right? And those guys are set to 0. So in principle, you could have a catalog of that if you want. Exactly. Is a flux of that. The only constraint is I need to have something that look realistic. I, I have to get a Poisson plus clustering, and I need to get a distribution. That's the distribution I put it in. So whatever the frequency you decide. Yeah. Yes. Oh, you say if I could add, add, for example, coherence or something like this. I could try to do that, yeah. That's probably what you guys need. Yeah, I could try to do that. Or you also, once you have the HeoPix catalog, you say, let's pretend I have 150, and then you can, you can try to add a delta alpha for the spectral index. You could try to do that yourself, yeah. I don't know, yeah. But remember, if you do that, you have to random generate probably. 
back to index. Yeah, you have to do it. Yeah, you have to you have to flip the coin again. Uh, well, that's the problem. The whole thing about point sources being variable, right? They they change from non if you observe a certain point in the sky, tomorrow they do not look exactly the same, and from frequency to frequency. That's why point source. That's why many times people say, "Oh, I get all those catalogs of point sources, and I'm going to correlate in the same position." What I observe in many different frequencies, but statistically is okay, but physically this doesn't quite make sense because you know they are variable, right? No, I didn't try. I could try that. That's a good idea. I could try to check it out. Yeah. What? What? You, yeah. What models? Yeah. Yeah, I can try that. Yeah. But then I'm going to try to do this in the hill peaks map because then you have lots of points to do the. Yeah, just in case. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessary. Yeah. yeah. Between the two. No. Yeah. On flux. To constrain those, I think that in uh, in the case for 21 centimeters to have a deep survey, that don't have it, right? This stuff is very shallow, right? Look at the the limits of the survey. Let's see if I come back. I, for example, for example, you have things around 250. I don't think this and and the surveys are they don't cover. The, I think you need a little. I think you need deeper surveys. But yeah, you can ask that. You can answer that. The same feeling, yeah. I think it's a question of having a deep survey that you don't have at those frequencies, like you have at 1.4. Yeah. No, I did not. I only got stuff that they found in Vizier, that I found in the in the in the database catalog, like Vizier or Aladdin, or whatever. Yeah, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, but those, those, the, the whole, yeah. Now, the whole idea behind this particular thing is that we want, for example, in the end of the day when you have the whole real peaks, so we are going to pass that through maps. So then we want to know what, basically, let's assume I have MWA, so what has happened with my sources if I don't remove them well and I'm close of the limit of detection? No. No, because if it, if it's something that's extended, get more than one pixel. I think you can, if you can point out, you can remove it, right? You have a concern, yeah. yeah. But how we are going to? Okay. Yeah? Can I? Yeah? Can I move it?